Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us. My name is RJ Witherow, and I'm the events manager here at Parnassus Books. Tonight, we are so thrilled to present local author Greg Howard for his new book, The Visitors. Just as a reminder, you can get signed and personalized copies of The Visitors from Parnassus Books. There will be a link for you to order those signed and personalized copies in the comments below. Also in the comments, if you have any questions for Greg tonight, feel free to leave those in the comments for a chance uh, of having those answered during tonight's presentation. And uh, tonight we are also joined um, by actor and TV host, Chuck Long. So I'm thrilled to uh, turn it over now to Chuck and Greg. All right, thank you so much, RJ. We're so excited to be here, Greg. It's another Yes, book once again, here we are. Oh my gosh. And of course we are launching this book right here, Greg's book, The Visitors. Hoping you can see that. So this is one of the best books that I have read in a long time. And Greg, we're going to get into talking about it. And um, like I said, it's just got so many levels to it. But before we get into that, I thought we might talk a little bit and kind of reflect on how the last couple of years have been for you. Because when you first started writing and wanted to get published, so many great things have happened since then. So I just wanted to highlight just a few. Okay, The Whispers, an amazing book. It's been optioned by Call Me By Your Name's producer, Peter, Spills, uh, Peter Spears, to make a film of. Um, then uh, Middle School's A Drag, You Better Work, has been uh, picked up by producer David Heyman's Heyday Television. And of course, he's from uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Marriage Story Films. Uh, that's for television, so that's exciting. Edgar Ward nominee for The Whispers. Uh, best Books of the Year uh, from The Advocate, that was The Whispers. And then Middle School's A Drag, You Better Work was an Amazon teacher's pick. Uh, so just kind of, those are just some of the highlights. You've had so many rave reviews and so many awards. How does it feel at this point, knowing that this has all come to be? Well, it's a dream come true and kind of a, a, a dream that I hadn't really realized was going to be part of my life. You know, it's, it was a passion when I was a kid something I kind of put away when I came to Nashville to be in the music business and then didn't revisit that dream and that passion until just the last, um, you know, few years. Uh, my first book came out in 2018. So it's, it's been wonderful to have kind of a second act at life, but doing something that I, could, I just love to do and really fulfills my creative juices. It's just been wonderful the way the books have been received. Oh, absolutely. I, I've got to ask too, now when you're writing, for example, with the visitors about to come out and before it came out, you were already talking with these producers about TV projects and film projects. Do you write with that in mind that this might be a TV series, it might be a movie, or do you just write and, and worry about that later? No, I can't. I can't think about that when I'm writing. You know, I never have... Um, Middle School's a drag, for instance, you know, I, I didn't know that was possible. You know, it happened with the visit, um, excuse me, the whispers after the whispers came out. And with Middle School's a drag, I just didn't think it was the kind of thing that would, you know, be looked at by TV producers, you know, and it, and it was. So, and then going into the the visitors, I, I don't really think about that. It's too much pressure. I mean, there is enough pressure trying to get the book written, <laughs> trying to get it out, <laughs> do a good job for my publisher and for my readers. That's all I can worry about when I'm writing a book. Hit the deadlines. Hit the deadlines. Oh, my <laughs> poor editor, I because I don't always hit them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's turn now to the visitors. And I want to now read some of the early reviews because they're really good. Uh, Kirkus is saying innovative use of perspective and atmospheric reckoning with the past and present, heavy but rewarding. Booklist says a ghost story of substance. Chapter 16, I love this one. Uh, a hopeful and affirming book with a sympathetic, relatable main character. The Visitors is ultimately a story of hope and redemption. So how do those early reviews hit you so far? Well, you know, it's, it's always good to get them, of course. Uh, but when you're writing, you are so you know, in your own little world, you really don't know how people are going to respond to it, you know, and, and you're putting months and months, sometimes years, you know, people put into books with no idea of how it's going to be received. So you certainly can't think about that when you're writing, but when you get the book off to your editor and your editor likes it and we get it to a place where you feel good about it, you still don't know how the reading public is going to respond to it. So 
even to get just those first early reviews from friends, you know, is very helpful. And then, you know, to get it from like chapter 16 and book list and Kirkus is it's very rewarding. It just lets you know, yes, I can do this because I promise you most authors, if they're like me, every time they finish a book and they get ready to start another one, they really do wonder if they can do it again. I know that sounds crazy, but it's true. We really go, oh my God, I don't know if I can do that again. Yeah, got to start from scratch each time. So I know right. that's a challenge. So let's just kind of dive in. And by the way, we're glad that uh, all of you are watching on Facebook Live. If you have any of those questions, once again, just uh, put those questions in the chat and we'll get to those a little bit later. So we're glad you're with us. All right, Greg, so let's just start off with a brief synopsis of the visitors. What do you want readers to know going into this? Well, I want them to know a couple of things. One, that it the book is classified as middle grade because the main characters fall within that kind of 10 to 13 year old range. Uh, but it's really a book that can be enjoyed by any age group. I tend to write books that that kids enjoy, but adults also enjoy because I would, you know, I also love when parents read my books with their kids. And so you want them to be interesting to the parents and to the librarians and to the teachers who can get them into the hands of the kids you're trying to reach. So uh, first of all, that's the, that's the genre it's a middle grade genre and it's a ghost story and i've never written a ghost story so that was a whole new experience and it is a mystery there's a, actually um uh, several mysteries going on which kind of keep you guessing throughout i kind of designed it to end each chapter with wait a minute what's going to happen next but it, overall it's a story of the spirit of a 12 year old boy who finds himself, uh, spends his days stuck, so to speak, on this deserted rice plantation in the low country of South Carolina, Georgetown, South Carolina, where I grew up. And he doesn't know who he is. He doesn't know how he got there. And he certainly doesn't know how to move on from this very sad, lonely, scary sometimes place. So the story is about his journey through figuring out who he is, why he stuck there, what happened to him. All he remembers is that something, there was a boy there, something bad happened to that boy and that our narrator had something to do with it and he doesn't remember what he did. But long come these modern day kids uh, from 2022, let's say, and they are investigating a mystery for a podcast for their school, a true, a true crime podcast. And he starts hearing names and facts that they're talking about that stir up his memories. And he thinks that they may be able to help him figure out his past and how to move on from this place. And I have to be careful because I don't want to give any spoilers away. Part of the fun of this book, part of the amazement of this book is discovering those mysteries and going down one trail and you think you're going down another and then suddenly you realize something else has happened. So it's just it's masterfully written, especially from that mystery uh, angle. But I got to ask you too, when you started writing this, you talk about ghost stories, suspense. Um, you know, I look at it as a little bit of coming of age and that kind of thing. Where, where did you start? Did you start thinking, I want to write a ghost story? I want to write a mystery story, a coming of age story, a sorrowful memory, uh, just a brand new idea. Where, where did you start? Well, I don't honestly, to be truthful, I don't put that much thought into it when I'm starting a book. I do, however, like you said, I start with, you know, this plantation, this deserted rice plantation, you know, I grew up right down the road from the setting of this book. And I based the setting of this book on that exact a deserted rice plantation in George, South Car Georgetown, South Carolina, that I grew up down the road from. My brother and our neighbors would we would ride our bikes down there, down this long, creepy dirt road, you know, and just we we knew the place was haunted. Everybody talked about how haunted this plantation was, and it was so creepy. And yet we were drawn to it. You know how you know how that happens with something that's so scary, but you're just drawn to it. And we'd ride our bikes down this long, narrow dirt road through this just forest of sky high pine trees until you came out into the plantation uh, that was this wide expanse. There were live oak trees hanging over the dirt road, the sandy dirt road. The Spanish moss was dripping out of the trees. It was every, and, and then, you know, in the, in the down dotting in the distance was the manor house and everything you imagine about a creepy kind of Southern Gothic uh, feel, that's what it was. And it was real life. And so we got very, we've, we kind of got our, the bejesus scared out of us, as we used to say, uh, down south. But uh, 
that place really stuck with me. And so I knew that I wanted to, to revisit that place and tell a story about these kids who go down to that place without really knowing the history of the plantation, but go down there for other reasons, for an adventure, for exploration, you know. And then quite frankly, from there, the rest of the story kind of fell into place. I didn't really set out going, I'm gonna write a ghost story, but once you've got a place like that plantation and it being haunted, it just kind of made sense for the main character to be a spirit. And I just thought that would be an interesting way to, to start off the story. And one of the things that was exciting for me, you and I have been good friends for a long time, and I've actually been with you to that rice plantation. And mm -hmm. to see you bring that rice plantation to life, because when we went there and you told us about your, your you know, adventures there as a boy, it's amazing. And the atmosphere you describe in the book is just, I mean, it's exactly what I experienced when I was there. Yeah, and it's kind of, it's interesting how your perspectives change, you know, because when I was a kid, I thought this plantation was, I thought it was beautiful, you know, just physically beautiful, the tree, the, the live oak trees, the structures that were in ruins and falling down. Um, there is a slave village, what they call the slave village, where there's a few cabins left that the enslaved people lived in. Uh, the whole place kind of had this beautiful, peaceful vibe to me, but then when I grew up and I learned the history, you know, the true history of the Antebellum South and what probably or what did transpire on this plantation, when you and I went with some friends as adults, I had a completely different experience there. I mean, it was more of like we were walking on hallowed ground. I don't know if you remember, but there were even some tears when we walked into the slave chapel. You just felt like the, the anguish and the heaviness of, of the people who suffered and died there. So I really wanted to be careful um, and tread respectfully around those stories. Well, he did an amazing job with it. So the main character, as you said, is a ghost. So what were the main challenges in writing a story centered around a ghost? I would say challenges, but also opportunities. What, yeah. what did that present? Well, it was it was interesting because when you when your main character is a ghost, uh, it's kind of like a fly on the wall. You know, when the when he's a narrator and you're getting all this narration of his experience at the plantation and being stuck there for many, many years. He doesn't remember exactly how long. And then when these modern day kids show up and he's following them around, he's really likes a fly on the wall. He's spying on them. And he's basically, you're listening to what's going on with these kids through the narrator. Now, that was fun because he got to be a silent, you know, just standing off in the corner, listening and watching. And that's how we learn what's going on. But what I had to be careful was, you know, you don't want a book that's all telling, you know, there's telling and there's showing. Telling is when you say like, um, Joe did this and Joe did that. And you don't really show what he's doing. Like Joe picked up the spoon and put it to his mouth. That's more showing. Um, so I had to be careful that this character didn't become like an all telling kind of character. He had to be involved in the action. He had to have his own story and his own action going on while he also were, were our eye. He was our eyes for these uh, for these modern day kids. So it was really exciting to try something that different. And I really enjoyed it. OK, I'm going to go to one of our uh, viewer questions right now. Catherine asks. Would you say this plantation was your inspiration to your imagination as a child? You know what? I will say it had a big, big part of that because it was a time in my life where I needed escape. You know, in the time that I was going to this plantation, there were some some dark things going on in my personal life. And I'm talking, I was a kid, you know, but, you know, I, I was living with an abusive stepmother. My mother had passed away. I knew I was a gay kid and I knew from my religious upbringing that, I could not tell anybody about that, just the things that were told to me from the pulpit and from society. I didn't see myself in books and movies and television shows. So I learned to escape into my imagination to places that were more palatable for me as a kid. And going to a place like this, I immediately created my own um, reality, quite frankly, kind of like I did in The Whispers with the story of Riley, how he had some very dark things going on. So he escaped into his imagination. So I would say it definitely made a huge, huge impression on me as a kid. Now you talk about the plantation and Catherine, thanks for that question very much. 
Um, the plantation, even knowing how you named this plantation in the book, Hollow Pines. So tell us about that. Oh, how the name came about? Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because it didn't start off as Hollow Pines. It, originally, the, the name of the plantation was Timber Hill. And I don't know where that came from other than that area of the country is all about pine trees. You know, International Paper Company is based there and there are pine trees on every corner. There are just forests full of these gigantic, tall, gigantically tall pine trees. So timber is where that came from. And hill, I don't know, it sounded good. But, you know, it's the low country of South Carolina. There are no hills. <laughs> you know, you've been there. There are no hills. So my editor and I were thinking, we really need a better name for this. You know, I don't want hill to be in the title, for one thing, in the name of the plantation. So I just got to thinking about how, one, when you're going into that plantation, you're just surrounded by pine trees until you get to the actual plantation property. It's almost like uh, you're just suffocated. You know, you're just surrounded by them on that road and you feel like they're closing in on you as you're driving down that road. So obviously that's where the pines comes in. And hollow to me was the feeling I felt when I went back there as an adult. Um, and saw it through a completely different lens of, you know, having learned what really happened there and having, you know, friends, people of color, and not just having this romanticized view of the antebellum South. So the place felt very dead to me. It felt very hollow. So that's where I came up with Hollow Pines. Fascinating. I love that backstory. Um, now, you were also talking about just a little bit ago, the relationship that the ghost has with the modern day uh, kids that are in it. So Mateo, Maya, and Thomas. Um, and that relationship throughout the book is, it's funny, it's touching, um, it's suspenseful. Kind of tell me about that relationship, the way that you built that with those characters. Right. Well, at first, you know, Maya and Mateo are twin, um, twin brother and sister. And Thomas is their friend. They are doing a podcast for a school fair kind of project, and they're doing this true crime, true crime mystery about this boy that went missing on this plantation some 50 years ago. And there are these suspects about, they, they suspect who might have done what to this boy and what might have happened to him. So they're so engrossed in this mystery and doing this podcast to win this school fair, you know. And then you've got our narrator who's listening in and he's hearing, wait a minute, they said a name, they said Will Perkins. I know that name, I knew Will Perkins. He was the boy that got hurt here, you know, and I had something to do with it. And so he gets so uh, engrossed in what they're doing and following them around. He almost gets possessive of these living kids, you know, like you can't leave until I know what you know, because it might help me move on. So he gets a little manipulative about trying to keep them there, trying to trap them there, which is kind of creepy, you know, some of the things he does, but he has a good heart and he, he really wants their friendship because there have been visitors to this plantation over the years, but never visitors his own age or not or rarely visitors his own age. So he really wants to befriend them while at the same time, he's trying to trap them there so they can help him learn how to move on. So he kind of eases his way into their life, into their conversations, and they've got their own issues going on. You know, uh, Maya is trans and she and Thomas are best friends, but their relationship has shifted since she came out as trans. So there's some tension there. And then Mateo suffers from a lot of anxiety. And so he and his sister have some tension there. And, you know, the narrator is just trying to to, to become their friends. You know, Thomas also lost his mother. So he's dealing with a horrible stepmother like I was. So it's really interesting, I think, as an outside person just reading the book, how he infiltrates himself into this friend group. And finally, he knows that if he's going to truly be their friend, he has to let them see him, you know, because he can be invisible as a ghost until he decides to let someone see him. And when he makes that decision, I need to let them see me it's kind of pivotal, uh, excuse me, a pivotal moment in their relationship and within him as a character. Yeah, absolutely. And talking about that's one of the mysteries through the book. So did you have a good time kind of sculpting the mysteries that happen through, book, through the book? And can you kind of touch on one or two without getting too much away? Yeah, there, there are several mysteries going on. First of all, the main mystery is, is who is the narrator? You know, which of the players from that past mystery um, is he? And the other uh, mystery is why is he stuck there? 
uh, how did he die? The other uh, characters in the book that are in, that are ghosts are some of the enslaved uh, people who were there uh, in the past, as well as the plantation owner and his wife and the school teacher. Why are they stuck there? You know, so we have a lot of questions to answer. And the biggest uh, mystery is how do they all move on from this place, the people that are stuck there. So what I wanted to do was kind of weave two stories together. So the, the two different perspectives we get are the narrator, who is the ghost of the boy in the present day um, action. And then we also get flashbacks of this boy, Will Perkins, who the modern day kids are investigating his disappearance. So we get to see flashbacks of Will Perkins' story leading up to what happened to him and our narrator at the plantation um, when, when he died. And I kind of wanted to build it throughout the book, keep the threads going, you know, let people in on a mystery here, but save this mystery for later. I know some people are going to figure out some of the mysteries early on, and that's fine. That's part of the fun of it, you know, is kind of figuring out some of this. But one of the things I tried to do, and you, you commented on this, is I tried to end every chapter with a little piece of uh, sus suspense to draw you into the next chapter. Okay, I just have to say that you are the master at ending a chapter. Every time you end a chapter, I get chills, I get goosebumps. I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I'm thinking about it right now. So many of the endings of the chapters. So you're the master at that. I just absolutely salute you. you for that. I don't um, know about that, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now, this book, um, it's going to make you think and feel deeply too. It, it brings yeah. a lot of humor. It brings a lot of thought. Uh, like I said, it's very touching. It's very moving. Um, I did want to note some of the reviews because, you know, it's, it's a strong book, too. And it, I, I alluded to or read some of them at the beginning of our chat. But uh, some of the reviews, uh, heavy but rewarding, atmospheric and, yes, challenging. So what were some of the, um, the biggest challenges that exploring some of these themes um, presented to you? Because there are some challenging themes in this book. Yeah, there are some topics that you don't read a lot about in middle grade books. I tend to just kind of dive into those topics because, yes, they're challenging, but I feel like I can find a way to make them palatable for younger readers. I can <clears throat> find a way to meet them where they are in their lives without um, without it feeling too adult, you know what I'm saying? I look at those 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 topics, I started to say hot topics, some in some ways they are. Uh, I look for ways to to bring them down to the level of young readers. And sometimes I do that with humor. Sometimes I do it with charm. I do it a lot with heart. But yeah, in this book, we're dealing with a lot of heavy themes. We're dealing with bullying that might lead to self-harm. We're dealing with slavery, you know, the truth of slavery. We're dealing with physical abuse within a family. But I do feel like that uh, I, I found a way because it, you know, it had to pass the muster of my publisher, my editor, you know, people who know what's going to fly out there. I found a way, I think, to tell this boy's story um, in a way that kids are going to recognize themselves if they're going through those things, but it's not going to be so heavy that it freaks them out. Do you know what I mean? It's challenging. I'm not going to say it's easy. And there are going to be some people who say, well, you shouldn't be talking about A, B, or C in a middle grade book. And that's fine. You know, if people want to say that, but I look at it this way, I have to meet kids where they are. And I know for a fact that kids are living in these in these challenges every single day. I did, you know, when I was young, I dealt with some of these things. I talked to kids every day through emails. And when I was, you know, outgoing to festivals and school visits, and they would come up to me and tell me, you know, I was going through a really dark place and I didn't want to be around anymore, but reading, you know, the whispers or middle schools of drag made me, you know, get out of that place. So if, if the book can help just one of those kids, you know, feel like they are not alone and that, that they have hope, then any pushback I get, I can take it. Well, and, and kind of like you said, too, uh, when I was growing up, I would have loved to have had a book like this that, that was an engaging, mysterious ghost story, but also had some, some uh, subject matter in there that when I was going through some tough times that I could relate to. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, some of these kids go through the same thing. Maybe there's somebody right. I can talk to. Absolutely. Right. Now, in the visitor's description, it notes, 
These visitors are around his age, talking about the narrator, and they seem to understand more than others that the plantation is not just spooky or eerie. It's a sad place where the unspeakable happened again and again. So how did it affect you going to those sad places? Uh, well, it, it was kind of an awakening for me. I, I mean, you know, I, I do deal kind of with the slavery issue head on in this book, uh, and, and I do it in a way by introducing characters of, you know, spirits of enslaved people who would have been there. And I kind of wanted to do that for a couple of reasons. One, it's set on a deserted rice plantation. So to just ignore that and ignore those stories would have been incredibly disrespectful and just wrong. And the other reason is I wanted to engage, quite frankly, young white readers who are maybe not taught the real truth of slavery. Uh, I wasn't when I was a kid. We were given this very whitewashed view of slavery. You know, the slaves were happy. They were treated like family. A lot of die, die. Everybody was happy, you know, and that just wasn't the case. So I just wanted to gently engage young white readers with a part of history that they don't have to think about if they don't want to, you know, um, and hopefully they will reach out to people who are different than them and have some meaningful conversations about that. But I tell you what, also some of the other sad places in this book, um, I went through personally, you know, um, when I was 12, you know, I, I wanted to die. I was, I knew I was gay. I knew I liked boys. My, you know, the religious, uh, the religious, uh, the structure around me told me that I was going to hell for that. I was bad, you know, when I was praying every night not to be that way. It was just terrible uh, for a little kid to be going through that. So I had these feelings of just wanting to escape, um, which is, I had to kind of revisit that in this book. And with also with the, uh, the physical abuse within the family, um, growing up with an abusive stepmother, you know, I felt like I had to go there. I'm thinking, you know what, if I live through that, there's some kid out there right now who's going through that. And so it wasn't always fun to be quite frank with you, but I tried to make it in a way that was palatable for younger readers. And uh, I didn't share all my pain, but I just introduced those things as things that kids might be going through. Right, well, it's very, very compelling. So, so glad that you did. And like, like I've heard you say before, if you just give kids the truth, they know what yeah. to do with it. They know what to do with it. Right, exactly. So let's take a little turn now, Greg, because there's, there's also some, some uh, parts of the book that are just so, um, pleasurable. There's a lot of pop culture references, 60s and 70s pop culture. Um, for example, uh, being the favorite, he loves, the narrator loves Bobby Sherman, but he can't understand why nobody knows who Bobby Sherman is. So like, <laughs> how did you come up with Bobby Sherman? Oh, because I was obsessed with Bobby Sherman when I was young. <laughs> okay, so younger kids reading this book are not going to know who Bobby Sherman is. Their parents probably do know who Bobby Sherman is, so they will enjoy reading about that. Exactly. But um, when I was a young kid, Bobby Sherman was a huge pop star. He was a teen heartthrob. I had a huge crush on him that I could not express how I felt about that to anyone. You know, I, I listened to his records, you know, in secret on my little Mickey Mouse you know, record player, his 45s. And so I thought it would be fun because this kid, you know, uh, died, you know, 50 years ago. So the pop culture references that he talks about are 50 years old. And Bobby Sherman would be one of those. Uh, it wouldn't be, you know, um, it wouldn't be Lady Gaga or Ariana Grande. It would be Bobby Sherman, not Shawn Mendes. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> So, and he doesn't, he doesn't really understand the time difference of where these modern day kids are coming from and where he's from. So when they don't know who Bobby Sherman is, it's not that he expected Bobby Sherman to still be alive, but he's thinking, surely Bobby Sherman is remembered just like Elvis and Frank Sinatra, <laughs> you know? So that was a lot of fun to kind of bring some of those pop references in that I think adults are really gonna enjoy. I think so. So they get some of the carpenters, a little lost in space. Um, and then also, um, and it kind of this happens throughout the book, but Walter Cronkite, Walter Cronkite plays a role through here because uh, the narrator grew up watching Walter Cronkite and especially touching is the part of the book where Walter Cronkite comes on air and he sees him uh, announce that uh, the president has been shot. Yeah, I, you know, I grew up watching Walter 
Walter Cronkite. And again, I know young readers aren't going to know that name. Adults, parents, teachers, librarians will. Uh, he was the anchor man for the CBS Evening News. And I, you know, it was black and white. And every night he would come on the air and we would gather around the television and all watch the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite together. And he, it wasn't like news today, guys. It was, it was just, he was a news reader. Um, I mean, I'm sure he was an accomplished man, but he read the news. He didn't give his opinion on the news. He told you what was happening in the world. And he was this kind of calming presence in my life when things in my home life were not calming or peaceful at all. When I watched Walter Cronkite, no matter what kind of news he was giving us, I felt calm and safe watching him tell me about it, you know, whereas in my daily life, I didn't always feel calm and safe. So I felt like I wanted to, again, because this kid died 50 years ago, he would have known who Walter Cronkite is. And I, I kind of gave him the, the persona of being obsessed with wanting to be an anchor man when he grew up and wanting to be just like Walter Cronkite. And so over the course of the book, he does talk about moments of history in America that he witnessed on the CBS Evening News. He talks about the moon landing and kind of getting it confused with his favorite TV show, Lost in Space. Uh, and he talks about, like you said, when uh, Walter Cronkite announced to the country that John F. Kennedy died. And I went back and I watched these clips of Walter Cronkite, you know, telling these, giving these reports. And I watched what he was doing. I watched his mannerisms. I watched what was on his desk. So when the boy in the book is talking about when he gave the news about John F. Kennedy's death, he talks about how he thought it was interesting that there were so many phones, you know, the old phones on on Walter Cronkite's desk. And he must have a really, you know, a lot of people trying to get a hold of him with so many phones, you know, because you could see his desk on the newscast. You could see all these phones. And then it struck me when Walter Cronkite uh, gave the news about John F. Kennedy dying, he took off, he was visibly moved and he took off his glasses and he looked up at the clock to say what the time was and the president had died and he looked down and then he put his glasses back on and I believe he took them off once again. So that made an impression on me and it made an impression on the narrator uh, when he felt those emotions that he didn't know what to do with, he almost thinks, I wish I had glasses like Walter Cronkite so I could take them off and put them back on and take them off, put them out, something to do with my hands, you know. So I really, really enjoy doing that. Again, I, I tried to couch, I know kids aren't going to know who Walker, Walter Cronkite is, but they can learn about the history of those events in our in the U.S. history by reading those sections of the book. Yeah, and especially like you say, how the narrator was so, so affected, so touched by Walter Cronkite and the way that he delivered that. So I also want to make sure that we get to uh, some, some more of these questions. So I'm going to go back to these. If you have a question, we don't have a lot of time left, but make sure that you uh, go to the chat and put those questions in and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, Travis asks, right now there are pushes to remove books from classroom libraries that cause discomfort, such as, and I don't want to butcher this, M-A-U-S, is that mouse? Um, yeah, mouse. Th this book is critical, but it does include topics that, as we know, will ruffle feathers. Would you speak to the reasons why this book is important for now, for our world, for our kids, for adults, for all of us? Well, books like that, you know, it, it's just a shame that they are being ripped from the shelves because they just tell our history. They tell it actually in a beautiful way that kids can understand. Uh, that book is a classic, you know, and yes, there is, there are, there are moments in the book of kids, you know, dying in concentration camps, but that happened, but it's actually done so beautifully well in that book. And I, you know, I say beautiful in the fact that it was beautifully done, not that it's a beautiful subject, obviously, but it was done so well and, and has been in, in classrooms and in libraries for so, for so long. It's really a shame that books like that and books some books, I don't even get why they're being pulled off the shelf. I just heard that Walk Two Moons by Sharon Creech, um, which I loved, and I don't even get why it was pulled off shelf. You know, Newberry winners. Uh, it's frightening to me, but it's so important that we fight and that we keep these books on the shelf for many different reasons. One, to, so, our, so our kids in school understand what really happened in our history. One of the best ways to not repeat history is to understand what happened, the truth of what happened, but also that kids feel seen and represented. Think about the, the Jewish kids who, who know the story of concentration camps and what happened in World War II. That's like pulling them off the shelves. It's like erasing them. When you take books like mine off the shelves, you're erasing kids that are represented in my books, you know, LGBTQ kids. 
uh, middle schools of drag has been challenged in, in the schools. The whispers has been challenged in schools. So it's, it's frightening because if I, I write the kind of books I write because I wish I'd had access to these books when I was a kid. It would have saved me a lot of heartache, a lot of self-hatred. If I could have just seen myself in a book and known that I wasn't alone in the world, I wasn't the only little boy who felt this way, and that there was hope for people like me. Because when I was a kid, I didn't think there was any hope for people like me. So that's why I think it's so important to fight to keep these books on the shelves. Oh, yeah, and fight hard. All right, uh, Tony asks, all of your books are very different. How do you come up with all these stories? Well, they all they all are born a little bit in my experience. You know, they all have pieces of me in them. My young adult book, uh, Social Intercourse, was kind of uh, inspired by my high school experience uh, in South Carolina. The Whispers, I just wanted to tell a story about my mom and how close I was to her, her. And, you know, she died when I was very young and made such an impression on me. Uh, then middle schools of drag was more of a comedic thing. Uh, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a kid entrepreneur and I actually did try to start businesses in our storage room, laundry room in the garage. <laughs> and, uh, so a lot of my business ideas from back then are in that book. And then with, with the visitors, like I said, I mean, I was so impacted by this place, this, this certain place that I felt like I needed to write about it and talk about the stories that, that happened there. So I don't really know, Tony, to be honest with you. I don't, I don't know. They just kind of come up and, but they're all pieces of my past. And I think that's what people respond to is when you leave part of yourself on the page. And that's what I try to do. Speaking of leaving a part of yourself on the page, I, that kind of makes me think of another aspect of the book, uh, The Visitors is the food and it's oh, very enjoyable and it conjures up. I mean, some really great Southern uh, food. Um, let me go to this one part that uh, I just wanted to point out. The ghost boy talks a good bit about the food he misses from the living world, his grandma's cooking and quote, this is what he says, what I wouldn't give for one more meal of grandma's cooking, fried chicken and pork chops, yellow rice and giblet gravy, green beans, turkey, perlo, black eyed peas and mustard greens. Everything she made tasted like home. What a description. I can just see that on the table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is totally a, a nod to my grandmother. But I also wanted to give a nod to, because this book is set in the low country of South Carolina, there's very specific cuisine down there that we grew up with. Uh, Perlo is a dish that you will basically only find in the low country area, you know, around Georgetown and surrounding areas. It's a, uh, and for people who are interested, I make it every year at, at Thanksgiving. Uh, it is a, a dry rice dish with sausage and chicken and a ton of black pepper. And then everybody, of course, has their version of it that they think is the best, you know, but if you want my recipe, feel free to go to my website and um, just send me an email. I'll be glad to send you uh, my recipe of it. But yeah, my grandmother was one of those grandmas like for Sunday dinner, she would cook not only fried chicken, but fried pork chops and a turkey and a ham. You know, it was like every Sunday, it was a bounty of riches, you know, in, in that house. And they weren't rich people, to be honest with you, but they apparently spent most of their money on food. <laughs> so I just thought it would be fun, you know, to kind of give a tribute to the area and to my grandmother by talking about all the food this kid misses. It's been 50 years since he's had any real food. So on the plantation, they they just kind of pretend that they are making these things. They kind of pretend that they're eating them. Uh, and I just thought that was really fun. Oh, and, and you even do that with Rita May, one of the ghosts, um, just going through the motions of making breakfast like she does every day. This morning, she serves up thick slices of country ham, eggs over hard and hoe cakes drizzled with honey. At least that's what Emma tells me it is because there isn't any real food in sight. So again, like you say, they're just pretending to see all this. Right, right. And in case people don't know what hoe cakes are, they're cornmeal pancakes. They're a little bit smaller, but they're delicious when you drizzle some honey over them. So that's what that is. And talking about Rita Mae, let's talk a little bit about the ghost because the ghost, very fascinating characters in this as well. Um, Cornelius, Rita Mae, Emma, Preacher, Teacher Man, Miss Rebecca, Jackson Culpepper, who is described as a pure devil. Um, Tell me a little bit about how you came up with these particular ghosts and, and their characters. Well, you know, obviously, if there are ghosts on this plantation, there would be ghosts of enslaved people, uh, obviously. So I wanted to I wanted to tell their stories and I wanted to tell them in a way um, that was respectful, but didn't pull any punches. And so I 
I kind of based these characters on different people from my life. Um, Retha May is kind of the grandma kind of character. Um, my grandmother's name was Retha May. So that's where the name comes from. Emma was kind of the young, um, kind of sassy um, person in the, in the narrator's life there on the plantation. Cornelius is actually based on okay, this is for a longer discussion later, but when we went there as kids and we saw this one ghost that I will, to my dying day, say actually happened sitting on the porch of one of the, one of the slave cabins, uh, that's where, where Cornelius was inspired from, from this spirit, this entity that I remember as a kid seeing, uh, sitting on that porch. So that's where that came from. And, and then, you know, there's, there's a schoolhouse on the property. So there would have been a teacher, you know, there's Culpepper, who is the owner of the plantation, and he's kind of the evil spirit. He's kind of the devil that won't die. He's kind of the South that, you know, the bad parts of the South that won't die, you know. So it was a lot of fun um, creating these characters and then giving them their time in the book to have their stories told. Well, just in talking about this, we, we've gone from so many different angles, so many different ways uh, that you've approached writing this book. So I'm just curious, what was like the total experience of writing this book? The mystery, the suspense, the ghost, the, the challenging parts, uh, the humor. Um, what was the overall experience? Well, I'm not going to lie. This was the hardest book I've ever written. And it's one reason is because the story is, is, is complicated. You know, there, you've got two different timelines going on. You've got uh, two different perspectives going on. The, the, the present tense of the narrator, the past tense of the flashbacks of Will Perkins' life. And you've got all this converging of these two characters and their families and these friends. There was a lot going on. So it was quite challenging. Um, I thank God for my editor, Stacey Barney at, at Penguin, because she really kind of held my hand through this. She saw that there was an amazing story here and she helped pull it out of me. And when I got done with the visitors, I will say, I thought I'm never writing another complicated story like that again. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I had to add all the humor, you know, just to keep myself afloat and trying to get this thing done. But uh, of course, now I'm writing a book about time travel. So here I, here I go again. Now, so, and I touched on this a little earlier when I said that you are the master at ending a chapter. But what I didn't follow up, I meant to with that question too was, how do you come up with the end of each chapter? I mean, is that something that you were thinking I've got to get them to go to the next chapter, or is that something that just kind of flows naturally for you? Um, well, I don't want to be boastful and say, oh, I can do that in my sleep, but because I because I can't. Um, it, you have to think about it. You have to plan for it. So when I read a book, I want to read a last sentence that makes me want to turn the page. That's what I want to do. So I have two techniques that I'll share real quickly of how I do that. One is I end a chapter with a line or a sentence that is kind of like a, you know, shock and awe moment. Oh my God, oh my God, you know, or I will end a sentence to where you don't get the answer for what that sentence means until the first sentence of the next chapter. So both of those cases, people want to keep going. You know, if there's some kind of shock and awe kind of ending to a chapter, they're like, oh my God, what happens next? Or if they read a line and they go, what does that mean? You know, they're going to turn the page. But I think that's what kids love. You know, that's what keeps kids engaged. And quite frankly, it keeps adults engaged too. I know that's what I like. Absolutely. All right. Just a couple of minutes left, Greg. Kind of what is your hope for the visitors? You're putting it out into the world. Here it comes. Kind of what is your hope for it? Well, my hope is that it reaches the kids that need it. My hope is that... If there are kids out there who are feeling lonely and hopeless and like they're the only kid in the world like them, that they will see that they're not, that they will see seen, uh, feel seen and validated and know that there is hope. And no matter how dark their lives may get, whether it's you know physical abuse, whether it's bullying, whether it's your own self-hatred you know, um, for just being who you are, whether it's religious impression, that they know when they read a book like this, that they are not alone and that there is always hope. Well, it is just a magical, fantastic, powerful read. 
Um, make sure, I want to make sure the link in the comments, uh, you can order the book. It's the visitors. Greg will personalize it for you. I'm already having him personalize one for my niece, Presley. So who has read your books and just absolutely is one of your biggest fans. It really is just an amazing book. So you've done it again. So congratulations, Greg. Thank you, Chuck. I really appreciate it. All right. So it's been a pleasure being with you. Get your uh, books at Parnassus. All right. Have a good evening, Thanks. everybody. Thanks, guys.